All right. Well, Richie, thank you so much for yeah, giving us the, the time to talk with you about okay. your research. And we know that you are a very busy man with many <laughs> interviews already and obligations and all your scientific work. So thank you so much for being here. Happy to do that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I, uh, you're the founder of the Center for Investigating Healthy Minds and yeah, the leading professor here. Um, you've been doing research for decades now and started with really interesting uh, research on emotion, as you describe also in your book, The Emotional Life of Your Brain. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the research that you started with, the research about emotions? Sure. Uh, I started with uh, research on emotion because one of the things that uh, I was very curious about and was so salient to me was that when you look around at people in the world, uh, there is tremendous diversity in how different people respond to life's challenges. Some people uh, are able to cope with adversity um, very skillfully and uh, uh, they're able to uh, get right back to what they're doing and uh, not be particularly perturbed um, by stressful experiences. <clears throat> and for other people, when challenges occur, it really interferes with their ability to conduct themselves. And those variations across people seem to me to really be the key to understanding <clears throat> well-being, why some people uh, can thrive and grow uh, in the face of challenges and while, while, why other people uh, decompensate uh, and sometimes can become uh, seriously disturbed uh, in the face of those kinds of challenges. And so uh, understanding better what the origins of those differences are and the causes and the consequences we believe would be helpful in promoting uh, a more positive kind of emotional style to help people uh, relate to adversity in a more skillful and productive way. So you describe in your book also that there are uh, different types of emotional style, like as you described, people uh, deal with situations in, in different ways um, and how, those, how there are different factors of emotional situations <coughs> contribute to that. How would you describe yourself? Uh, what kind of emotional style uh, would you describe yourself? Uh, I would say that I'm um, pretty resilient <coughs> and uh, uh, I have a, uh, uh, I mean in, in the book I describe six specific emotional styles and they are based on their neuroscientific research <coughs> and in the book I actually uh, uh, estimate where I fall on each of these different continua. And uh, in general, I would consider myself to be uh, <coughs> fairly well-adjusted and someone with uh, um, fairly uh, uh, optimistic and high levels of well-being. But uh, uh, certainly, I um, have my own challenges. And uh, uh, my research on emotional styles has certainly been helpful in me becoming more aware of my own um, challenges in response to stresses and adversity that occur. So you're also, uh, apart from your research on, on emotions that you started out with, you're famous for your research uh, on meditation, the neuroscientific uh, basis of, of meditation. Um, and in your book you describe also that like, with, with all the like, many obligations, the very hectic and stressful life that you have, um, that meditation might be like, the thing that also allows you to do to do that. Um, how does meditation affect, um, yeah, your emotional style? Um, well, I would say it has a. For me, it's had a very profound effect. I uh, definitely uh, believe that my ability to do what I do and to uh, function the way I do with uh, the complex life that I lead <coughs> is very significantly aided by my meditation practice and uh, I think that if I were not meditating I'd really uh, be in seriously bad shape uh, given the kind of uh, lifestyle that I lead. Um, 
So it's it's really helped enormously. It's helped me, uh, I think, be more emotionally balanced. It's helped me to um, relate with more kindness to people that I interact with on a daily basis. Um, it's helped me be a better listener. Uh, <clears throat> and I think it's helped me to lead the organization that we're, uh, um, that we are a part of, which has now grown and become uh, um, a, a complicated organization with more than 50 people working in it. Uh, and so uh, uh, the insights that I've gleaned from my own meditation practice, I think, have helped me become a, a better leader. And um, yeah, I would like to, to turn also to um, the creative part, basically, of, of being a scientist. And yeah, it's, it's really, uh, what was astonishing to me when I read your book was really the, the creativity, basically, of your, uh, of your scientific research in, with the very limited methods that you, ha that you had when you started out your career, when there were not like the really fancy scanning methods that we have nowadays. Um, and I've been wondering how creativity plays a role in your, re in your research and how you would describe scientific creativity. Well, uh, it's a wonderful question. Uh, uh, scientific creativity is so important for uh, scientific research, and, and I think scientists can get stuck in ruts, uh, which um, uh, which constrains the kind of research that they do. And uh, one thing that I've tried to do throughout my career is to really be open and to re be receptive to uh, whatever uh, ideas emerge and, and to really uh, allow oneself to follow those ideas. And, and it also takes a certain amount of courage uh, and, and fearlessness. Some might call it foolishness. Um, but uh, uh, I think that uh, we, we the the creative process, if you really listen to it, uh, sometimes um, propels you to jump in to things that are really extremely novel, and uh, uh, you inevitably will make mistakes. And so one element of this is, is um, <clears throat> not being afraid to make mistakes, which I think is, um, is really an important part of this process, and and a good, uh, I think a good um, piece of the creative process is how you recover from those mistakes, uh, and what your relationship is to those mistakes, and um, uh, really being able to learn from them, to listen to them, and uh, to respond skillfully. Yeah, I've been wondering about that, about emotional types, uh, emotional styles, and creativity. If there would be, um, for instance, a particular emotional style uh, that is common among creative people, so regardless of whether it's artists or scientists, um, but if, as, as you say, like the, the capacity to recover resilience might be an important component, do, do you think that there is such thing as a, a, an emotional style uh, that would be common to creative people regardless of how they express that creativity? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. I think that there may be certain constituents of emotional style that are common to creative people, but I don't think that all creative people have the same um, <clears throat> overall configuration of emotional styles. I think that you can engage in creative work in different ways. And uh, uh, I have, over the course of my career, um, had the honor of, of meeting lots of creative people uh, who I can say with a lot of confidence are not all the same. And they may share certain elements. Uh, I, I do think a certain quality of resilience and a certain quality of courage uh, is important uh, that may be common, but uh, I don't think that the whole package of one's emotional style is um, uh, is going to be the same. Yeah, but just a, a certain configuration of 
of elements that might yeah maybe openness to experience or yeah I think there are certain elements that yeah. we encounter. Yeah. And um, how do you see the connection between art and, and science? Do you think that um, yeah that there are parts that artists and scientists can learn from each other? That there is something that they could contribute to each other's work. Uh, I think that there are elements of the creative process that are common uh, or at least overlap between artists and scientists and I think that when uh, scientific research is really conducted uh, um, in the way that it was kind of originally intended to um, fundamentally discover uh, and understand nature um, that the kind of receptivity and observation and creativity that is required is similar to what uh, I think um, an artist uh, taps into when she or he is engaged in artistic endeavors. Uh, I do think there are also some important differences. I think the methods of science are clearly very different than the methods of, um, uh, of art. Uh, and uh, there's a certain kind of rigor and um, uh, uh, empirical uh, grounding which um, is required in science and, and the, the rules of the game are different in, in the arts. Um, it's not to say that the arts aren't rigorous, I think in many ways they are, but uh, the same standards of evidence and observation are different. Um, so I think in certain ways there are similarities, particularly on the creative side, and in other ways they're, I think, quite different. But it's interesting that you say also that like the, that what scientists do is what was originally like, intended to uh, basically try to understand uh, nature in an empirical way, uh, fundamentally. But do you have the feeling that um, there, there seems to be more and more an emphasis on applied research, on research that can be... Um, used basically and, and it's, it seems that for many disciplines that do more fundamental research it becomes difficult to do research. Do you have the feeling that that kind of mechanism might um, impair creativity in, in research? Well, <coughs> I think that in today's world uh, <coughs> we are being um, constrained by uh, economic factors and uh, scientists are increasingly being asked to justify uh, the um, kind of questions that they ask and uh, I think in general it is true that it's more difficult to get funding for very basic scientific research that's not connected to um, a specific problem. Um, uh, so. Uh, uh, whether that constrains creativity or not, you know, I think it, it certainly has the potential to constrain creativity, but I don't think it necessarily constrains creativity. I think it will necessarily uh, change the kind of questions that can be asked and what can be discovered. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think it's a complicated issue, though. Does it affect your research or your way of uh, coming up with new ideas? Not really. Or, no? No, we've managed to stay above all that. <coughs> yeah. And where do you, um, I mean, in your creative process, where do you find your, your inspiration from, uh, yeah, to do your research, to just do in a way you think about the world and about the kind of problems? Well, I, you know, I think it comes from, uh, uh, the juxtaposition of deep periods of reflection um, when I'm alone in conjunction with opportunities to interact with others um, who are thinking about very similar kinds of things. And so uh, I don't think that one or the other is sufficient. Uh, and I think having both really allows uh, a certain kind of um, uh, flow of ideas to emerge that um, wouldn't be possible with, with, with either by itself. So, and I enjoy uh, very much both components. Mm -hmm. 
and those are your source of inspiration for all the wonderful research that you do? They are, yes. Yeah. Well, I hope that you continue for a very long time to do all the wonderful research that you do and come up with a lot of new creative questions to ask and creative ideas. <laughs> thank you so much. Because they are definitely an inspiration to others as well. Oh, thank you so much.